Okay, so uh, let me let me welcome everyone. Um, let's get started. Thank you for joining the sessions of the virtual seminars in economic theory. Uh, today uh, we have uh, Yuta Ishii from Penn State, who's going to talk to us about learning efficiency of uh, of multi-agent information structures. This is a joint talk with a joint work with Mira Freak and Ryota Ijima. Our today's uh, guest panelist is Jakob Steiner. The format of these seminars is as follows. Uh, we have a 60 minute presentation. Uh, this is with time for interim questions from the panelists. We request all attendees to keep your microphones muted during the talk. However, please post comments and questions in the chat. There's also going to be an opportunity to ask questions live in the Q&A sessions at the end. Um, this talk is recorded. Um, after the after the Q&A sessions at the end, uh, we are going to move to the informal part of the talk at the virtual chair academic metaverse. Uh, there will be a link provided in the chat. So we'll, we'll, we'll tell you uh, when we are finished and we are going to move there for more informal talk with people who are willing to just chat about, about the talk and other issues. Before I hand uh, over to you, uh, Yuta, uh, let me invite you to our next uh, talk next week. Uh, Nina Bobkova from Rice will present information choice in auctions. And as usual, you can find more information on our website and by following us on Twitter. Uh, so thank you, Yuta, and the mic is yours. Okay, all right. Um, so thank you, Max, um, and thank you for the organizers um, for providing this great public good. Um, happy to be here uh, talking about learning efficiency of uh, multi-agent information structures, which is joint work with both um, Mira Frick uh, and Ryota Ijima. So um, they've kindly agreed to join the talk um, as uh, attendees. So, um, you know, I'm happy to take questions um, live or you can, you know, pester them with questions in the chat and um, they'll, 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 they'll answer um, it better than I can probably. Okay. All right, um, and thank, thanks a lot very much to uh, Jakob Steiner as well for um, um, agreeing to be the panelist. Okay, I don't think I can see you, but uh, yeah, you're in there somewhere. Okay, all right, um, so let me get started. Um, let me tell you what the question is that we have. Um, I'll, 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 um, it's fairly straightforward to state, um, and then um, I'll talk about our main results and then put it into context in the literature, okay? So here's the question. Suppose that there's a group of players, um, for example, firms who are engaged in some kind of incomplete information game. Uh, in this example, it could be some joint investment decision in some risky project. Okay. Now, suppose that prior to choosing these actions, players have access to many draws of private signals from some information structure. We think of this as kind of capturing the fact that these players might have access to large data sets um, because potentially data is relatively cheap. Okay. We're gonna model this in our model as these players are going to observe private signals, okay, which are going to be drawn in an IID way across many, many draws, but potentially um, there could be arbitrary correlation across players in terms of their private signals within each draw, okay? And so we're gonna ask two related questions in this simple model. One is what information structures induce faster learning? Okay, now here we're interested in a setting in which there's potentially rich strategic externalities, okay? The firms or the players are playing a game, okay? And so, we know that in such game settings, it's important not to just consider first order belief, first order learning, okay? learning about some state of the world, but also learning about whether others have learned, learning about whether um, learning has happened about others learning, et cetera, okay? And so to formalize that, we're gonna consider, we're gonna study what information structures lead to faster convergence to common knowledge of the state, okay? All right. And then we're gonna use the answers that we find in this question okay, to answer the second related question, which is that which information structures induce better equilibrium outcomes okay, in these uh, uh, um, 
uh, in these game settings. Okay. For example, you could think about higher welfare for these players okay, in this incomplete information. Game. Okay. All right. So those are the two questions. Um, because I have, uh, because the talk is a little bit abbreviated, I'm going to focus for the most part on this first question. Okay. If I have time, so I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a, a preview of the results, at least of the second part of the uh, um, the paper, which is this set question. Um, if I have time, I'll, I'll go into detail there as well. Okay. All right. Okay, so what are our main findings? Um, we're going to propose a simple multi-agent learning efficiency index, which assigns to every information structure a positive real number. Loosely speaking, this is going to be based on uh, a statistical distance between the worst informed players' marginal private signal distributions. Okay. Um, so it's relatively simple index to compute for, from the given kind of information structure. And one thing to note here is that because um, only the marginal signal distributions of the worst informed player matters, in particular, this learning efficiency index is not gonna be influenced at all by the correlation across player signals, okay? All right. And so why do we propose this learning efficiency index? It's because it characterizes exactly the rate of convergence to common knowledge, which is our first result, okay? All right, learning efficiency index characterizes exactly the rate of con convergence to common knowledge. Okay. And somewhat surprisingly, uh, if you look at this rate of convergence, the common knowledge is going to be exactly the same as the rate at which everyone learns the state of the world at the first order level. Okay. And this was surprising to us because we typically think about common knowledge as something that's much more demanding than everyone having correct knowledge about the state at the first order level. Okay, so that's our first set of results. Okay. And then the second set of results, the answer to this second question is gonna use this result, use this first result on the learning efficiency index. Um, and we show that with large enough data sets, uh, uh, a higher learning efficiency leads to better equilibrium outcomes. Okay. And this is going to be robust for a class of games and objective functions with a property that we call alignment at certainty, which we'll be more precise about um, when we get to that part of the talk. Okay. Um, one nice feature of this is that um, 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 when we think about comparisons of information structures, what kind of information structures perform better, at least in terms of equilibrium outcomes, um, what this theorem is telling you is that you just have to look at the learning efficiency index for those two information structures, compare them, whatever information structure has the higher learning efficiency index is just gonna perform better in equilibrium outcomes um, without looking at the fine details of the games and the objective functions that you're considering as long as it satisfies this property that we call alignment at certain. All right, um, any questions so far? Okay, very good. Uh, I'm happy for you to unmute yourself and ask questions along the way. Um, I'm fine with that as well, okay. <clears throat> okay, just to put this into context in the related literature, um, <laughs> there's a um, literature on learning with higher order beliefs, um, um, which is um, somewhat extensive. Um, the directly related model um, is probably the model by Cripps, Ely, Malath, and Samuelson's econometrica paper, um, which studies basically exactly the same model that we do here. Um, the, the, the point or the, the distinguishing feature is that they look at uh, the, uh, the, the question whether uh, players get uh, attain common knowledge of the correct state as uh, the number of, as the data set becomes larger, okay? Um, what we're doing here is basically characterizing exactly whether, what that rate is, okay? So they show that with probability one, everyone eventually attains common knowledge of the correct state 
Um, here we're characterizing exactly what that rate is. Okay, and so we think of our result as kind of complementing um, uh, or strengthening potentially the result because we're saying that um, uh, the rate of conversions is relatively fast, and moreover, it's as fast as you could have possibly expected, which is the same as the rate of conversions to everyone just learning at the first order level. Secondly, um, we also relate to the literature that quantifies speed of learning in single agent decision problems. Um, and so that uh, a related paper um, is Muscarini and Smith, which can be seen as kind of the single agent um, version of our problem. And indeed the learning efficiency index that we have here boils down to um, the index that Muscarini and Smith propose in their paper, okay? In single agent decision problems. There's an extensive literature and growing literature on quantifying speed of learning in social learning settings. The key um, uh, difference here is that we consider games with rich strategic externalities, whereas the externalities that are, you know, kind of studied in social learning settings is typically purely informational, right? And finally, um, at least the second part of the paper um, we, 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 we relate to the literature on comparison of information structures. Okay. Um, so this goes back um, to the seminal paper by Blackwell, of course, um, that's been extended to um, repeated observation of um, IID draws um, recently in the, the paper that I just mentioned by Moscarini and Smith and also um, Xiaosheng Mu uh, who was supposed to be a panelist today. Uh, uh, um, he has a nice paper as well with co-authors um, that extend that order to large samples. Okay. There's been attempts to kind of try to ex uh, extend um, or generalize comparison of information structures to settings with multiple agents, game theoretics, uh, game settings. Um, here, typically they focus on one-shot information structures and in such settings, um, you get a partial order. Um, so basically you can't compare very many information structures because the ordering is just so partial, okay? And that shouldn't be surprising because, you know, Blackwell ordering is partial even in the single agent setting. And so when you go to multiple agents, it's even harder to make comparisons. Um, what we do in this paper is to look at large samples and show that you get a relatively more complete ordering. Um, so you can compare much more information structures in terms of equilibrium performance. Okay. All right, um, so that's the introduction um, and related literature. Let me go now to the model. Um, and then I'll talk, uh, I'll spend a lot of time on um, 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 characterizing the rate of conversions to common knowledge. And then um, if I have time, I'll spend some time on um, using those results to rank information structures in games. I'll pause there for questions if anyone has any. Okay, all right, so let me get to the model and the formal question. Okay, so here's the setting. There's a finite set of agents, which is denoted capital I. There's a finite set of states that are payoff relevant which is capital theta. Each agent is gonna, uh, all the agents are gonna start off with a full support common prior over these set of states, which is gonna be denoted P0. We're gonna be studying information structures. So what's that? Um, there's going to be a space of private signals of player I, which is gonna be denoted capital XI. We'll assume that it's finite um, uh, and X will be the you know, profile of all signals. Okay. For each state, so it's, the state is going to be drawn at time zero according to the common prior and fixed for the remainder of um, uh, the time uh, uh, for the eternity of the game. Okay. Um, and this is going to be drawn, uh, uh, this is, uh, and, and, and given that true state, there's going to be a signal distribution okay, from which players learn, okay? So the joint signal distribution over 
all players marginal private signal distributions is going to be denoted by mu theta. And mu i theta is just the marginal of this joint distribution over player i's private signals. Okay, we'll assume that each mu i theta is full support and that every mu i theta is distinct from every other mu i theta prime for any two pairs of um, distinct states, theta and theta prime, so that with large enough data, every player i will be able to perfectly um, 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 distinguish the states. For the talk, I'll also assume that the joint distribution is also either full support or perfectly correlated. This is not necessary for the results, but um, uh, it just simplifies the exposition. Okay. All right. So now, um, what, do, what does each player I observe? Each player I is going to be privately observing the XI coordinate of um, this drawn signal profile X. Okay and nothing more, okay? So he, player I just observes his own private signal and nothing more. Okay. We're gonna be concerned with the setting in which players have access to large amount of data. And so we're gonna assume that agents observe TIID draws uh, from um, this information me, structure. Let, I. Me, let, let me use this opportunity to, to break the yeah. eyes and yeah. ask a question. So, this literature focuses typically on the serially uncorrelated signals. So they can be correlated across periods, but not across time. Yeah. Now we know that matters. And the serial correlations can easily arise when the signal generating process has some social background. If it is a process of people talking to each other, or there is some right. social learning involved. So, so what is the, is there some canonical justifications of the serially ID assumption? Or is there a um, okay delineation when it holds? Right. Um, I mean, uh, uh, my answer to that would be first. Um, I think of this a kind of the natural first starting point um, of you know kind of the, the easiest model that we could study in terms of you know studying this question about you know speed of common learning, um, um, and so. Um, that, that's why we started with this model. Um, definitely there's interesting questions that you could ask if you allow for kind of serial correlations. Um, and um, we've thought a little bit about it. Um, um, what I would say is that um, in that setting, even the question about whether uh, Asians attain common knowledge of the state in the limit, okay, Going beyond just going beyond the question about rates, um, that question itself is open, um, and um, we don't have you know kind of a full understanding of even that question. Um, and so there's a lot of you know interesting research to do there as well. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that that's that's kind of um, 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 yeah. But I agree that there's you know. A lot of interesting economic applications where you know kind of the IID assumption is not you know um, um, the right one. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. And and uh, I'd be happy to chat more about you know relaxing the IID assumption. I think that's very interesting, and we've thought a little bit about it. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so uh, the question that we ask is, as when T is sufficiently large, how fast do Asians converge to common knowledge of the state? Okay. Um, later, we'll use the answer to this um, to draw implications for Bayesian Nash equilibrium outcomes in games played after a large number of signals. Right. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right, so, in order to tell you about our, you know, uh, characterization of the rate at which common learning is attained, um, we have to do a little bit of kind of preliminary stuff. Um, so first, what do we mean by common learning? Okay. Um, formalize the notion of common convergence to common knowledge. Okay. And so we're going to use 
uh, Cripps, Ely, Manneth, and Samuelson's notion of common learning, um, which is the following. So given any P, okay, think of this as a belief threshold, okay? This event, BTP of E is going to be the event that all players assign at least probability P to the event E. Okay, you can think about this as all the set of signal histories that each player could have observed in which every player I is assigning probability at least P to the event E, okay? All right. So that's just first order beliefs because it's just asking the question whether um, each individual P believes an event or not, okay? We're gonna extend that now to think about second order beliefs, third order beliefs, et cetera. So we're interested also in the following event, which is what are the set of histories or what, are, what, what is the event in which everyone assigns probability P to everyone assigning probability P to the event E, okay? And that's gonna be BTP squared of E, okay? And then we don't stop there. We're just gonna you know, keep going for every K uh, that's a whole number, okay? We're interested in the infinite intersection of that, okay? And that's uh, what's known as the common P belief event, okay? The event in which all players commonly P believe in the event E. All right, so let me tell you what's known in the literature about um, uh, properties of this event, and then um, we'll go to our question, okay? So Cripps, Ely, Manath, and Samuelson show that for each information structure I, players commonly learn the true state, okay? That is, give me any P in between zero and one, and give, it, uh, uh, give me any true state theta, okay? The probability of, this event, which is that everyone assigns, uh, uh, which is that everyone commonly P believes in theta converges to one as T goes to infinity, as the day, number of data grows, okay? All right, okay, so that's known. Um, we ask, what is the rate of convergence of one under each information structure? Okay, how fast is this happening? Okay, and we think that's relevant because you know, for this to be a particularly kind of strong result, we would like this to take place at a relatively fast rate. Okay. Okay, so to characterize exactly what this rate is, um, we need to define a couple of things, which is the learning efficiency index, okay? And so the learning efficiency index is going to be built off of, um, uh, uh, a measure of distances between probability distributions, okay, which is known as the Chernoff distance. Okay. And I'll give you exactly, you know, um, uh, the reason why um, Chernoff distance is important in the proof. Okay. So here, this is just a mathematical formula for the Chernoff distance. Okay. It's this, the solution to this min-max problem. Okay. Um, where this KL is basically the callback leibler divergence between probability measures mu and mu and mu and mu prime, okay? And that's the, that's the formula for the callback leibler divergence, which um, many of you probably have already seen before, okay? Roughly speaking, lower D captures greater difficulty of distinguishing mu and mu prime. So for example, if mu is exactly equal to mu prime, this turnoff distance would be zero, right, okay? Um, and you know, if mu and mu prime are not equal to each other, this is strictly positive. Okay. All right, um, just to give you kind of, so this mathematical formula might seem a little bit, you know, kind of puzzling. Uh, you might not get a lot of intuition out of, out of just seeing the mathematical formula. I'm gonna show you what this means in terms of pictures. Okay, so suppose that you have um, um, your usual kind of, representation of probability distributions over Y, which is the simplex. You take two probability measures over Y. Okay, so for example, mu or mu prime. Okay. When you're looking at this solution to this min-max problem, okay, um, you can quickly probably see that 
this is going to be minimized. The solution to this is going to be minimized at a new that is equidistant in terms of pullback Leibler to mu and mu prime. Okay. So I've drawn basically those equidistant points, which is basically this hyperplane. Okay, it turns out to be a hyperplane. Okay. And then what does the turnoff distance calculate? Well, it looks at the, 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 the probability measure that lies on that hyperplane that's closest to mu or mu prime. Okay. All right, so what does that look like? Well, it looks like something like this. Okay. So this is the new star. Okay, in that min max problem. Okay. The distance in terms of Kolbeck Leibler from this distribution to mu, which is equidistant, which is equal to this distribution, which is um, in terms of Kolbach Leibler, okay, is the churn off distance. So you can think about this as basically kind of the distance from each of these mu's and mu primes to the midpoint, okay, of these probability distributions in terms of Kolbach Leibler. All right. Okay. Um, another way to think about it is the following, um, which is the way I like to think about it. Um, uh, you can also think about drawing these, you know, kind of radiuses around each of these probability measures. Okay, so I've drawn balls of radius lambda in terms of kohlbeck leibler around each of these mu and mu primes. Okay. What's the churn off distance? Well, it's basically the largest lambda such that these two balls don't intersect each other. All right. Okay. And you can see that exactly in the form of these blue balls that I've drawn. Okay. All right. So that's another way to kind of um, visualize churn off distance here. All right. Um, okay, so what's the learning efficiency index? This index um, is going to, of information structure I at state theta is going to be given as follows. You basically calculate the churn off distance between theta, which is the true state, and any other state. Okay. Um, and then you look at the one that's hardest to distinguish for every player I and then take the minimum over all players i, okay? So it's a relatively simple one-dimensional measure to calculate because it only considers the player i and the state theta prime that's not equal to the true state for which the marginal signal distributions are most difficult to distinguish, okay? Notice that because the only things that appear in this expression are the marginal signal distributions, the marginal private signal distributions, correlation or the joint distribution beyond the marginal signal distributions plays no role or no, has no effect on this learning efficiency index, right? Okay. Um, just as a side note, in the single Asian case, this is equivalent to the index in Moscarini and Smith. Okay, all right. Very good, okay. Um, just as a visual representation of what the learning efficiency index um, is. Maybe, yes. Let me, let me refresh the, the, the process by another question. So I remember yeah. from, from uh, the, the old common learning paper that there is an issue with the continuous state spaces. So the common learning result fails if you have uh, continuous uh, space. Of, and this, this also seems to be appearing here naturally. Uh, right. Uh, so there might be something interesting going on as you are making your, your state space richer and richer and approaching continuity, which is not captured by, by the asymptotic speed of learning. So did you think about this limit of, uh, um, of continuous state spaces? It might be natural for application. Yeah, I think, I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, you're absolutely right that there's issues with common learning with um, yeah, very rich... Uh, state spaces. Um, it doesn't have to be too rich. The real line is enough. Right. I so guess. Very simple um, examples, like from yeah. Age, like, yeah. So, in terms of this efficiency index, right? Um, um, if you look at, uh, 
suppose I discretize the state space and then I'd make it finer and finer, right? Um, then definitely this learning efficiency index in the limit as I take that finer and finer is going to zero, right? Um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of consistent with the results in the continuous yeah. state space case yeah. where, um, you know, common learning doesn't attain. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, Good. There's thank also, you. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I think there's more to say about rich state spaces. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's something to think about. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> Okay, where was I? Yeah, okay, so just in terms of the visual picture, um, um, the, 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 um, this, is, this, is, this is capturing the efficiency index, okay? So, um, so in this example, there's just two players, player one and player two, okay? These are the um, probability measures over the private signals of player one, these are the distributions over uh, um, player two's private signals. Okay. Um, basically, the learning efficiency index is, you know, kind of again drawing these balls of radius lambda in terms of KL around each of the states. Okay. And we're taking it large enough such that the ball around the true state, which is theta, okay, doesn't intersect, or uh, we take it large enough such that it barely intersects. Um, any of the balls corresponding to other states for any player, right? Okay. So in this case, um, um, the lambda theta, this is distance here, is the large enough one to have that property. Okay. Notice here is that, you know, player one is the one that finds it most difficult to kind of learn the true state theta because he has the hardest time distinguishing between theta and theta prime. Okay, um, so that's the learning, uh, that's the efficiency index. Um, there's a question in the chat, um, which I can, you know, um, uh, which I can take. Um, okay, well, Ryota answered it. So, um, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe I, I don't wanna get too distracted and overwhelm myself. So I'll, I'll let uh, my co-authors answer. <clears throat> okay. All right, so theorem one is going to show that this learning efficiency index that I just constructed is exactly the one that characterizes the rate at which common learning happens. Okay. So fix any information structure I, take any true state theta and take any P in between zero and one. For T sufficiently large, okay, as T goes to infinity, the probability of this event, which is everyone commonly P believing in the state theta um, converges to one at exactly the rate determined by the learning efficiency index. Okay, All right, so that's, that's the first part of the theorem. Okay. Secondly, we can also characterize the rate at which everyone assigns probability P to theta. Okay, which is a much larger event. Okay, it's going to have larger probability because um, common p belief is much more demanding. Okay, it so, turns out, yeah. So, so one thing that surprised me when I was reading this was that the rate does not depend on stuff such as the p, the the, the approximation of, of the common knowledge in, in the. That's operation. right. That's right. It doesn't depend on the number of the players as long as you preserve the minimum of the of the distance. Yeah. yeah. And so that yeah. leads me to believe that the asymptotics, the, the, the index doesn't capture something uh, going on earlier on in the sequence. Like uh, surely when P sure. is increased, you have to wait longer, but somehow the, the, the asymptotic answer doesn't quite um, express yeah. that. So, so yeah. I wonder whether there is something being lost just by looking at the exponential rate, uh, looking at the tail. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so a couple of things to say about that. Um, you're absolutely right that if I vary p, that's gonna, sh that's gonna, that's not gonna change the rate. Okay, but 
it will show up in this little O of T term. Okay. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, yes, yes. This thing, the little O of T term. Okay. So the P ah. will show up there. Um, and, and I wonder whether, to, to what extent one can be misled by, by that being kind of thrown into the OT. Uh, like mm -hmm. maybe OT goes to infinity very quickly, or uh, maybe OT kind of explodes very quickly when, when P goes to one or stuff like that, which I wasn't able yeah. to find. Right. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, so in order to answer your question, we, we would have to calculate, you know, kind of more precise estimates of what this little O of T term looks like. Um, I think we can do that probably. Um, with enough work, we haven't done it, admittedly, in the paper. Um, uh, we could probably, um, yeah, um, try to see exactly, you know, kind of what's the dependence on P of this term. Um, also kind of, you know, one of the things that we're saying is that, you know, kind of this probability and this probability are very similar to each other when T is sufficiently large, okay? But um, yes, um, so um, when that, you know, can, wh when, when they become similar is going to depend on P as well, right? Okay, and so um, um, in principle, as P goes to one, uh, you might imagine that you need higher and higher levels of T in order to be able to kind of um, say that statement. So, so in, in other words, I'm asking this because it tells you whether you're, you're, you're Asymptotic result applies to large games with many players or to games where the strategic risk is very large, you really have to have a very close approximation of common knowledge. And so knowing this right. would help to answer that. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, I do think that um, in, in our proof techniques, I think um, also as n goes to infinity um, in large games, um, um, yeah, um, the, the, this thing is also going to be affected and become large. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so we're, we're thinking about the order of limits in which T is sufficiently large relative to kind of M or something. Yeah. So there's a horse race going on, right? Um, um, whether you think that you know, T is large relative to N or N is relatively large to T. So if N is relatively large, if N is large relative to T, maybe this is not a good kind of approximation. Um, yeah, um, yeah, good. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so, um, uh, um, um, okay. So as I was saying before, right, the, these probabilities converge to one at exactly the same rate, which was surprising to us. Um, and um, um, the reason is that, you know, the, you know a priori, um, you know, common P belief is a much more demanding notion than just everyone assigning probability P to theta. Um, so you might expect common learning to be much slower than individual learning. Um, and so th this theorem is telling us that um, um, common learning and individual learning occur at the same rate, okay? Right, with all the caveats that, you know, um, uh, Jakob just uh, mentioned, okay. All right, um, another kind of implication of this result, which is, uh, which was surprising to us is that under large samples, correlation across player signals has negligible effect on higher order beliefs. Right. Okay. Because correlation doesn't influence this learning efficiency index at all. Right. Okay. These are a function of just the marginal private signal distributions. Okay. And so um, that plays no role. And so the rates are um, um, going to be determined just by the marginal signal distributions. Correlation doesn't matter. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I have 20 minutes. So, um, um, I'll give you the proof idea. I, I might skip some steps. Um, so um, recall that lambda star, 
uh, I'm going to define this efficiency index for this information structure I. Um, the, by definition, this was this object. Okay. Uh, just for simplicity, so that I don't have to keep writing this lambda theta I, I'm just going to call that lambda star. Okay. Um, let's call theta prime the state that's hardest to distinguish from theta for the slowest learner J. Okay. So basically, J and theta prime are the minimizers of this problem, okay? Okay, and um, one particular object that's going to be important for us is I's empirical signal distribution up to time t. The reason is that um, that's a sufficient statistic for first order beliefs in this model because everyone's private signals are drawn according to a conditionally IID process, okay? Right. Okay, um, so the proof idea here is going to be the following. Um, we're gonna consider sets of this form. So what's these, what are these sets, okay? These are the signal distributions, or empirical signal distributions in which everyone's empirical signal distribution is within this radius in terms of kolbeck leibler to the true one, okay? All right will show that no matter what this epsilon positive is, as long as T is sufficiently large, okay, the probability of this set will be an upper bound on the probability that everyone assigns probability P to the correct state, which is also lower bounded by the probability of everyone commonly P believing in theta. That's just trivial, right? Because common P belief is more demanding, it's a subset of BP theta. Okay. And then finally, this will also be lower bounded by the probability that everyone has signal distributions within lambda star minus epsilon to the true distribution in terms of kolbeck leibler Okay. All right. By Sanoff's theorem, um, which is a tool in large deviation theory, you can calculate exactly the probabilities of these events, okay? Which is basically just the calculation of the likelihoods of empirical frequencies. Um, it turns out that the probability of these sets is basically given by, um, uh, it's going to converge to one at rate exactly equal to the radius of the set in terms of kolbeck leibler okay? All right, and so both of these are going to be converging to one at rate lambda star and corresponding lambda star minus epsilon, okay? I take epsilon to zero um, and then this sandwiches everything um, um, at the same rate. And so we get the conclusion that we want. Okay, all right. Um, let me kind of give you an overview. I'm gonna skip the first step of this because you know, just upper bounding the result, uh, upper bounding the probability of you know, everyone assigning probability P to the correct state. Um, that's just the kind of statistical argument. We're not thinking about interactive beliefs or anything like that. Um, and so I'm gonna skip that part just for, to save time, okay? Um, but what I'm going to focus on is the second part, which is the lower bound, okay? Why is it the case that, you know, this set is a lower bound on everyone commonly P believing in theta, okay? And so this is kind of what I think is the most interesting part of the proof, okay? will show that when T is sufficiently large, this event where everyone has um, um, empirical distributions within lambda star minus epsilon to the true distribution that they should have observed at state theta is going to be a subset of common P belief when T is sufficiently large, okay? First, um, in order to show that, we're gonna first show that this event is contained and everyone assigning probability P to the state theta, okay? Um, and that's kind of straightforward because um, if you're in this set, FT theta lambda star minus epsilon, that just means that everyone's empirical distributions are inside the red balls, okay? If you have players with empirical distributions inside the red balls, then those empirical distributions are gonna be closest in terms of kolbeck leibler divergence to the true theta, 
relative to anything else, okay? And as a result, you know, these guys' beliefs are going to, it's a standard result in learning that um, these players' beliefs are gonna converge to one as T goes to infinity at any of these empirical distributions inside these red cells, okay? All right. Okay, so that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but how do we go beyond that to show that this is also contained inside the common P belief event, okay? There, we use a tool from Mondorer and Samet, which says that it suffices to show that this event is what's known as P evident. Okay, that means that whenever everyone has empirical distributions that are within this ball, around, lambda star minus epsilon ball around the true distributions, then everyone also assigns probability P, at least P, to everyone else also having empirical distributions inside this lambda star minus epsilon ball. Okay, All right. Once we establish that, then Mondorer and Samet says, okay, uh, FT theta lambda star minus epsilon is also inside the common P belief of theta event. All right, so how do we get there? Um, so notice that this is a statement, P evidence is a statement about linking kind of one's empirical distributions to beliefs about other people's empirical distributions, okay? And so we have to conduct, we have to analyze the inference that players are doing about other people's signal distributions. Okay, so this is how we're gonna think about it. Suppose that player I observed this empirical distribution of private signals, then what are his beliefs about I prime's signal distributions? Um, so I can calculate I's expectation of I prime's signal distribution in the following way, right? So, if he observes this empirical distribution of signals, then this proportion of time he observed Xi. But then every time he observed Xi, he would expect player I prime to observe this fraction of Xi prime, okay? Where this is the actual true correlation between kind of I signals and I prime signals. All right, so this is the expected empirical distribution of I prime conditional on I's information, new I, okay? Conditional on the state theta, okay? One thing to notice here is that if it so happened that player I's empirical signal distribution was exactly equal to the theoretical one, then his expectation of player I prime signal distribution should be exactly I prime's true theoretical distribution, okay? That's just coming straight from the um, definition of this or the construction of this expectation. Okay. All right. So the key lemma that's gonna do all the work for us um, in providing, uh, improving this lower bound result is the following. Okay. Suppose that player I observed this empirical distribution of signals. Okay. Then if I compare, if I look at the callback liver divergence between this empirical distribution that I observed and the true one under state theta, that's always going to be greater than or equal to, in terms of callback liver divergence, the distance between I's expectation of I prime signal distribution, empirical signal distribution, to I prime's true signal distribution. And moreover, this inequality is strict whenever nu i and nu i theta are not equal to each other and signals have full support, okay? In words, this is saying, every player expects his own signal distribution or the data that he observes to be most atypical, the furthest away from the true theoretical distribution, okay? Just kind of, you know, I think it's in, this is an interesting fact, I think, in its own right. Um, um, the proof I'm not gonna show you is relatively straightforward. It comes from a property of um, callback liver divergence, which is known as the uh, chain rule. Uh, it's, it's, it's only a couple lines to prove this, um, but um, yeah, I think of this as kind of an interesting kind of insight in and of itself. When I was yeah. reading this, 
I was confused at this moment uh, why an expectation of others and breaker distributions matters. And you have a great answer. It just comes too late for my 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 my. my oh, name. okay. I, see. So I think it's worthwhile to say that at the end you will apply low large numbers and explain why. Yes. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe it's worthwhile to kind of put that up front. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Right. Okay. Yeah, but the expectation for, 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 for those of you who haven't read the paper, the expectation is coming from the fact that, um, yeah, by law of large numbers, the expectation is a good approximation of I's beliefs about I prime's um, empirical distributions. Okay, yeah, that's in the next slide. Oh, good. All right. Um, okay, so this is saying, yeah, every player expects his own signal distributions to be most atypical or the most rare, okay. Um, just to kind of give you a loose idea for why this might be true. So notice that when you have conditionally independent signals, okay, so conditional on the true state data, everyone has IID, everyone has independent signals, okay. Then notice that um, the right-hand side is always zero. Why? Well, my empirical signal distribution doesn't inform me anything about I prime signal distribution because of the independence, right? Okay, and so I expect I prime signal distribution to be exactly equal to the true distribution I prime. Okay. On the other hand, with perfect correlation, you have exact equality in this inequality, right? Okay, because new I, if I observe empirical distribution new I, then I think that I prime also observed the exact same empirical distribution of signals because of perfect correlation. Okay. All right. Um, just as a side note, um, there is a similar idea that appears in Cripps, Ely, Maleth, and Samuelson um, um, in order to prove their common learning result. Um, there, um, for those of you who know that paper, there they use. Um, the L1 norm instead of kolbeck leibler that we're doing here. Um, the reason why we use kolbeck leibler is because it's very important here to characterize the exact rate of common learning, okay? Um, okay, all right. Just in terms of pictures, um, what's happening is that um, if player one observed this empirical distribution of signals inside this red ball, okay, then he expects, this is conditioning on theta, sorry. Um, um, this conditional expectation of player one having observed this empirical distribution about two signal distribution will also be inside this red ball and vice versa. Okay. So you can probably kind of see where I'm going with this. I'm gonna use this uh, expectation uh, property in order to be able to link um, 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 in, in order to be able to talk about the inference of player one about player two's empirical distributions of signals. Okay. All right, so here's the implication of that lemma, right? We're gonna show that for all large enough T, um, whenever I have, and this is exactly what we need to prove P evidence of that set of balls, um, Whenever the kolbeck leibler divergence between the empirical signal distribution of I to mu I theta is within lambda star minus epsilon, then it implies that I assigns at least probability P to I prime signal distribution also being within lambda star minus epsilon to the true one, okay? So the first step of this is to see that by the key lemma, okay? This is true for every T, okay? Because now we're looking at the expectation. Okay. We're using the strict version of the inequality um, um, that we had before. Okay. So that's why we can get the strict inequality here. Okay. Having observed that by the law of large numbers conditional on theta, this expectation is a good approximation of I's beliefs about I prime signal distribution because by law of large numbers, we expect kind of uh, the empirical distribution of I prime signals to concentrate with high probability around this expectation, right? That's standard law of large numbers. Okay. And finally, um, why 
are we allowed to condition on this data here? Okay, when I'm computing this expectation, well, it's because whenever I have empirical distributions within lambda star minus epsilon ball around mu i theta, um, I becomes almost certain that the state is theta when t is sufficiently large. Okay, and putting all those three together gives me this implication. And as a result, this implication basically exactly says that this event that we constructed before is P evident for Li T large. Okay, and that's exactly what we needed to prove, right? Okay. All right, um, I have five minutes left. So um, I'm going to um, do a whirlwind um, overview of what we do in the second part of the paper, which is using that result. Um, to be able to compare information structures in terms of equilibrium outcomes in games, okay? Um, and sorry if um, um, this is going to be too fast, um, but um, hopefully it gives you kind of an idea of what we do there, okay? So, so far I've only talked about kind of a learning problem. Now we wanna embed a game on top of this learning problem. Okay, so suppose that after observing T signal draws from I, agents play some incomplete information game G, okay? With the state space data um, um, that we started off with, okay? The question is which information structures I lead to better Nash equilibrium as T goes to infinity? We're gonna evaluate outcomes using objective function W. Okay, so this is gonna be exogenously specified, which takes as input an action profile and the realized state and gives me some real number. Okay. You can think about this as a social welfare function. Um, uh, common examples would be something like a utilitarian welfare function, or um, this could also embed things like designer's preferences. So. Maybe the designer cares about you, you taking a particular action profile um, a lot in a particular state, okay? So, um, so those are, the, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're fairly general about the types of objective functions that we allow. A key assumption that we're going to impose is that um, for each theta, the W best outcome, look at, so for each theta, Look at the best outcome in terms of, so the, the designer is going to maximize over the action profiles, okay, according to W, okay. This particular action profile that's the best, okay, is indeed a strict Nash under common knowledge of theta. So if the Asians had common knowledge of theta, then um, the Asians would be willing to play um, this particular action profile in um, Nash equilibrium. Okay. You know, my, my impression of this part of the paper was that it assumes that the agents are going to use the common knowledge to benefit of the social planner. Like that if they are multiplied yeah. equilibrium, then they, they are going to pick the nice one or the one that the right. social. So that's right. Uh, I mean, this, this is worth kind of, kind of defending or, or because the adversarial objective is quite common in, in other papers. Uh, so. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, we do make the assumption that, um, yeah, you're allowed to pick the best equilibrium outcome in terms of W for you. Um, um, we do, um, yeah, so that's what we do, yeah. Um, another way to say that is that, um, you know, um, if you have an equilibrium in information structure I, then, and, and, and I look at another information structure, I tilde, then I can find the Bayes Nash equilibrium that dominates in that, um, in that one relative to this one. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's um, nice interpretations in, in terms of that. Um, I agree that um, basically being able to compare the sets of equilibria or something like that would be appealing as well. Um, uh, we don't have, um, any way to do that, but I, I, yeah, I, I think it's interesting to be able to extend it. Yeah. Um, okay, um, let me um, just state the theorem and then I'll wrap up and then I, I'm happy to you know, discuss further. Um, so what we do in this part is basically say, um, 
suppose that I have a game G and W that satisfies learning under certainty. Um, information structures with higher learning efficiency index induce better Nash equilibrium um, whenever T is sufficiently large. Okay, so what's nice here is that um, 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 you don't need the fine details of games, the game or the objective function in order to be able to make a statement about what kind of information structures do better than others. You just have to look at the learning efficiency index, at least when T is sufficiently large. Okay. All right. And design implication here is that under large samples, we should focus on improving worst informed agents information because the learning efficiency index only depends on um, the, the, the ability of the worst informed agent to distinguish states, okay? Adding signals about other signals is not effective, right? Okay, because the correlation in the signals between the players doesn't influence at all the learning efficiency in that, okay, right? Okay, um, so I'll stop there. Uh, I had a thank you slide somewhere here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and th thanks, Jakob, and thanks to all the attendees for um, uh, for participating. Thanks, uh, Yuta, um, a lot. This was a very clear, clear presentation. Um, so normally we, we go into Q and A session. We st uh, still still recorded, still official. Um, so maybe we'll start with Jakob if you have any last last uh, comments or or reflections, and, and then we'll go to the audience after that. It, it was extremely clear given the difficulty of the of the topic. Uh, I uh, I didn't know this uh, this second thermodynamic uh, uh, mm -hmm. thing with, with with the mark of chains. Is is there a good intuition for for that result? Is 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 there some kind of elevator explanation of uh, uh, why why the, the global climate divergence is is decreasing? Um. I don't know if, okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, I might ask for Ryota and Mira to help. <laughs> um, do you guys have- Maybe there isn't, I don't know. I mean, it's a very um, cool. So, okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree that it's a cool result. And I think um, um, there are potential, uh, we, we, we think there's there should be like, other applications of this, I think, um, it, it sounds interesting, um, and it, there could be other economic applications. Um, we just haven't thought about it. Uh, we, we haven't come up with any clear um, applications. I, I will. I'll present. Uh, I, I'll show this slide. I don't. I don't have to go it in, in, into it in detail, um, but yeah, the proof is relatively simple. Um, um, but I, I, I still don't have a <laughs> yeah, that doesn't look yeah, like one enough. line, one line, <laughs> one line um, 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 explanation for the result. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have something, Amira, Rita? Yeah, maybe just super informal. I mean, the way to think of the second law is that if you have two initial distributions of some Markov chain and then you apply the transition matrix to them, they become closer to each other. And I think that's quite intuitive. You just start with two initial distributions, you apply some noise, you jumble them, that makes them closer to each other. That's how I thought about it. Eventually, they're going to converge to the, uh, to the end of the distribution. Bonds. Yeah, right. Yeah. But yeah, the fact that it's it's always kind of monotone decreasing at every point in time is kind of surprising. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any other questions? There's a some question questions in the, in the chat. chat. Um, is 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 the is the higher learning efficiency index also necessary for inducing better Nash? Um, yeah. So right. Um, yeah. So okay. Um, in the sense that if you have any two information structures with different efficiency indices, right? Um, then you know if I have uh, one of them lower, then it's 
by the theorem, right? Uh, it's all it's going to lead to lower equilibrium outcomes, right? So, so it's kind of necessary, um, except in the knife edge case when you know kind of um, uh, the learning efficiency indices are exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. I just perhaps comment on on the structural difference between your paper and the original common learning paper where Cripps, Evie, and the, the other guys they were kind of thin on the motivation for the question. And they hand waved themselves around uh, repeated games and, and common knowledge being important for, 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 for folk theorem, but they did not expand on it. They just purely focused on, on the binary question whether there will or will not be common learning. Whereas you do much more on, on on the motivated the second part of the paper the second part is kind of you know yeah. illustrating why this comparison but, might be but, but it's also kind of a more controversial part because there okay so my informal way of saying it is that you assume that the, the players will use the common knowledge for the good stuff like if we wanted to do a revolution in sure. Russia we impose some common knowledge and then we would believe that that would Induce the equilibrium we want them to, to do, and then it might right. not be the case. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so yeah. I mean, is, is it clear that this needs to be like in the same paper? Like this is, it looks like that you have to, you have done two very distinct contributions, uh, related, but but the, the, the two parts seems to be kind of living a bit on their own. At least the first one. Uh, you could do the same thing as, as, as uh, Crips and others by uh, solving an abstract question about the speed of convergence to common knowledge without getting into detailed application. Right. I mean, I, I, I mean, at least technically speaking, you know, kind of the second result follows quite easily from the oh. first set of results. And so, you know, uh, we felt it natural to be able to, to just include that as kind of an application of the first result. Um, um, but at a higher level, like philosophically, yeah, the, the, it might be two distinct questions. I, yeah, I, yeah. But um, I see Mira smiling. Is this recorded? But <laughs> yes, it's still recorded. Oh, okay. I mean, sorry, um, it could be a I, good I, uh, moment to to go into the informal part if you if you wish to say okay. some, something that should not be recorded. Uh, um, yeah, maybe. Um, How yeah, about we can, uh, if yeah, we if yeah. we if we you know transpose ourselves into the <laughs> virtual? Sure. Show. So I've I've put yeah. the the link. Uh, Two comments up in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't we go there? Well, why, why, why don't we stop here the the recording? Why don't we go there and and meet uh, in front of the you know once you pick your your avatar, we'll meet in front of the seminar room. Uh, see you.